Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar series, The More They Know, How Building Knowledge Powers Reading Success. My name is Lauren Brenner, and I'm on the literacy team here at Amplify. We are so excited to have you here for the first webinar in our series, Knowledge, Breadth, Depth, and Evolution, with the incredible Susan Lambert. I have a few notes to share before we go ahead and get started. Today's webinar will be recorded, and we'll email out the recording link for you to watch as you'd like or share with a colleague. Additionally, everyone here will also receive a certificate of attendance via email. Throughout the webinar, please drop any questions you have into the Q&A box, and we'll try to get to them at the conclusion. We also encourage you to comment in the chat. To kick us off, let's find out where everyone is joining us from today and what your role in education is. I'm joining today from right outside of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. Maryland, MTSS coordinator, Virginia, New York, Texas, California, Connecticut, Arizona, Allentown, PA. I went to college in Allentown, Indiana, North Carolina. Well, it seems like we have uh, people from all over presenting today and a bunch of titles. So we're so excited to have you here. Um, keep the conversation going in the chat. It's so valuable to everyone joining us today. And we also have more webinars this week and next week as part of the series. So if you haven't already signed up, please do. And to learn more about these events and to save your seat, visit amplify.com slash knowledge dash building dash webinar dash series. And we hope to have you join us at another webinar. We are so excited to have the amazing Susan Lambert here with us to kick off our webinar series and present today's session. Susan is the host of Science of Reading the Podcast. Speaking of the podcast, season eight is officially out and we're celebrating 5 million downloads. This season, we're talking all about knowledge and why it's so critical for literacy development and student success and how it can be built most effectively. And in addition to the podcast host, Susan is also Chief Academic Officer of Elementary Humanities at Amplify. Her career has been focused on creating high quality learning environments using evidence-based practices. She is a mom of four, a grandma of four, a world traveler, and collector of stories. As the host of Science of Reading the Podcast, Susan explores the increasing body of scientific research around how reading is best taught. As a former classroom teacher, administrator, and curriculum developer, Susan is dedicated to turning theory into best practices that educators can put right to use in the classroom and to showcasing national methods of reading instruction excellence. And without further ado, I'm going to turn the mic over to Susan. Welcome, Susan. We're so glad you're here. Thank you, Lauren. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. So let me know if something doesn't go right with it. All right, let's see. How's that looking, Lauren? Pretty good? Looks great. All right. Thanks everyone for joining us today. And just again, um, like Lauren said, make sure you let us know where you're from. So pop that into the chat box. And if you have any questions, slot those questions in the Q&A box. We're going to try to get some questions done at the end. We'll see how things go. We've got a lot to cover in today's webinar. Um, but before we get started, I would love to just read a short patch passage from the Phantom Toll Booth. This has recently become um, a new favorite for me. I haven't read it in years and I recently reread it. And this particular passage I thought was incredibly helpful um, and important for what we're going to talk about today. So this is um, uh, one of the characters reading to the other um, and giving to that character a box. And he says, in this box are all the words I know, he said. Most of them you will never need. Some of them you will use constantly, but with them you may ask all the questions which have never been answered and answer all the questions which have never been asked. All the great books of the past and all the ones yet to come are made with these words. With them, there is no obstacle you cannot overcome. All you must learn to do is use them well and in the right places. And I think this particular passage really helps us understand what we're attempting to do for children, which is helping them learn to read and understand what they're learning to read, 
um, and building their both their knowledge and their vocabulary. Again, if you haven't read this book for a while, I really encourage you to go back um, and reread it. It's just a delight. All right. So what are today's goals? Um, today, we're gonna talk about some definitions and frameworks just to ground ourselves in the science of reading. We're going to take a little bit of a dive into reading comprehension, what it is, what it isn't. We're quickly going to get to exploring the concept of background knowledge, both academic knowledge and vocabulary. And then we'll look at some instructional uh, applications and see what that looks like in terms of high quality instructional materials. So let's first begin by talking about comprehensive literacy, right? When we're in the world of science of reading, sometimes we forget that we're not just talking about reading, we're talking about all of literacy. And as a reminder, literacy is both receptive, we take information in, in terms of communication, and it's expressive. We actually, you know, output information in terms of communication. And this sort of develops on a continuum in terms of the developmental cycle. And so when we're thinking about receptive and expressive vocabulary with oral language, we're thinking about listening, which we do this from before we're born. And then we think about expressing that, and then we start to speak. When we think about comprehensive literacy in terms of written language, that's where we think about reading and in expressive language, we think about writing. And if you look at these four boxes, listening, speaking, reading, and writing, they pretty much develop in that order, that we listen before we speak, and we speak before we read, and we read before we write. Um, we're gonna cover both oral language and written language, but I really wanted to ground us in this idea that comprehensive literacy involves listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And when we talk about a definition of the science of reading, I love the Reading League's definition. It's a good reminder that what we're talking about is a vast body of scientifically based research. And it's not just from one discipline, it's really interdisciplinary. And it's related to issues about reading and writing, and we could say speaking and listening too. And this evidence uh, base is not just from the last few years, but it's actually been from five decades and across the world. And it's thousands of studies that have been conducted in multiple languages. And what we're looking at is evidence to inform us of how proficient reading and writing develop so that we can prevent and intervene for reading and I'd say writing difficulties as well. So I love this comprehensive definition. If you're not familiar with the Reading League, um, which I'm sure you all are, check them out. You can Google Science of Reading Defining Guide and you can get right to this document. It's a downloadable PDF full of super helpful information beyond just this definition. So one more framework that we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the simple view of reading and we're going to reference this a couple of times throughout the presentation. But as a reminder, the simple view of reading reminds us that skilled reading is really a product of two things. It's a product of language comprehension and word recognition. And the reason it's in a, a multiplication equation is because we know that we can't have one um, without skilled reading. So if we had zero language comprehension and we could only recognize words, we still couldn't be a skilled reader. Likewise, if we had zero language comprehension and all the word recognition, we still couldn't be a skilled reader. So it really involves both things. This idea of language comprehension is the thing that we're born with. We're born to be communicators and we start developing language before we're even born as we take in all the sounds that we hear. Um, and over time, then we start to hone in on those sounds that we hear. We start to hear words, we start to speak words, we start to put them into sentences. And the great thing about language is it continues to grow throughout our lifetime. We call these unconstrained skills because they continue to develop and develop and develop. And we're gonna come back to that too, as we talk about um, building knowledge and vocabulary. Word recognition is not, a naturally developing phenomenon. We're not, we are not born to learn how to read. It's actually a technology that we have to learn. And so word recognition is all about understanding how sounds are represented in print and how we can be really automatic with recognizing those words. 
And putting those two things together, we actually come up with skilled reading. And we're going to come back to that again in just a moment. The interesting thing about the simple view model is we typically see those two boxes the same size, but they don't have equal contributions uh, across reading comprehension over the, the developmental years. So what we know is that when kids are in kindergarten through second grade, those developing word recognition skills play a huge contribution in reading comprehension, a bigger contribution actually to language uh, comprehension. And, and that makes sense, right? Because kids don't know how the words are represented on the page and they actually have to learn those things. And so as they learn and grow in their word recognition, they become better at reading comprehension. However, when those word recognition skills are pretty secure, all of a sudden language comprehension takes over and has a much more, uh, much bigger contribution to uh, skilled reading than word recognition. And that makes sense too. Once we come really automatic as word recognizers, we have to draw on language to help us understand what the print is saying. So how do we do that, right? We, I'm gonna go back one slide. We don't want to ignore this language comprehension development in K through two, because if we ignore it, right, we're not gonna be prepared with that uh, growing language skills in grades three and up to be really good reading comprehenders. And the way that we do that is through listening comprehension. So um, if you're a podcast listener, maybe you just listened to the recent episode by Molly Ness about using read alouds in the classroom really strategically all the way through the grades, particularly in the lower grades to help bring that complex text and ideas and vocabulary to students in ways um, that they can uh, in, take it in um, as opposed to do, through reading and through writing. And we know that language comprehension is much higher in the younger grades than it is in the older grades. And this graph you can see along the bottom, it's actually ages of, of children. And our reading comprehension and listening comprehension actually don't catch up until about 13 years old, which is about the end of middle school. So we should really be leveraging li listening comprehension as we're helping students develop those language skills. I wanna remind us that we're gonna talk a lot about the framework of skilled reading, but there's also something called the simple view of writing, um, which helps us understand how skilled writing, the contributions of skilled writing. So there's a couple of things, right? So with skilled reading, we have language comprehension. Similarly, skilled writing, we have composition skills. Both of these language comprehension and composition skills are unconstrained, right? The more that you compose your writing, the more ideas that you have, the better you get um, at, at writing. And word recognition in skilled reading is a constrained skill. Once you know the words, you don't have to keep learning them. Similarly, in skilled writing, transcription skills are constrained skills. So they're really important contributors to skilled writing, just like word recognition is important to skilled reading. We're gonna be focusing on the language comprehension and sort of composition skills during the course of this presentation. And so I just wanted to remind us that these ever developing language, language skills are important both for skilled reading and for skilled writing. Many of you are familiar with the strands of early literacy development or Scarborough's rope. Um, and just a reminder that word recognition here on the bottom of Scarborough's rope, this is the place we want kids to be really automatic so they can use their cognitive energy then for the language, language comprehension side of the house, meaning that they can strategically approach text in terms of how they're reading. And we, again, are gonna focus on this language comprehension side of Scarborough's as we talk a little bit about knowledge and vocabulary. So what do we mean by skilled reading? Well, what we really mean by skilled reading is reading comprehension. And I'd like you to pause and think about this. What exactly is reading comprehension? Why is it so important? And when students have it, what can they do? Now I've done this in presentations, live presentations before, and you know, we find it's pretty hard to really capture a strong definition of reading comprehension. We kind of know why it's important, right? 
Um, but then when we start to think about what kids do with reading comprehension, what, what do, how do we know that they're comprehending? Um, it gets a little more complex. And I will tell you, we're going to look at the big five really quickly. I'm sure you could name these if I ask you to name them. Phonemic awareness, phonics and fluency, which are all sort of encompassed in that word recognition side of the house. And then we have vocabulary and this thing called comprehension. So we know these five things are really important. If you haven't read the National Reading Panel, I encourage you to read it because it really lays a foundation for what we know and it's continuing to develop about the science of reading. The interesting thing about comprehension is that it's not exactly the same thing, right? These five pillars aren't exactly all the same. We often see the big five in you know, various forms of graphics like these pillars. And the thing is, it makes them seem like they're all sort of the same. And when it comes to comprehension, for sure, it's not exactly the same as the skills of phonemic awareness and doing phonic, phonic instruction. And it sort of doesn't tell us how complex this is, um, but reading comprehension is very complex which is why I like to introduce the reading systems framework because the reading system framework, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna talk through this and I'm not expecting you to actually memorize it or anything, but the reading, compre or the reading systems framework shows us that reading comprehension involves knowledge, knowledge of linguistics, orthographic knowledge, academic knowledge, general knowledge. It involves processes of decoding, word identification, making some inferences, monitoring your comprehension, and also cognitive resources of working memory. And so if you found that you couldn't really define what reading comprehension is, or you feel like, oh, I, I kind of know what it is, but I only got a little tiny slice of it, it's because it's fairly complex and it involves a lot of knowledge, processes, and cognitive resources. A couple of other things that I like to sort of ground us in too is that we have to remember that reading comprehension is not either or or yes or no. When you read a when you read a passage, you don't comprehend it or you don't comprehend it. Comprehension is on a continuum, and we're going to dig into that a little bit more. The other thing is is that reading comprehension can't exactly be taught, and I've heard this a lot from Catherine Snow, who, if you know who she is, she is one of the originals in science of reading research, has been looking at um, evidence for, for reading for a long time. She will be a future podcast guest, um, as a matter of fact, but she reminds us that it can't be taught. There are things that you can teach, things that you can encourage, things that you can do with your students to impact their comprehension, but reading comprehension isn't exactly something that can be directly taught. How do we influence then reading comprehension or skilled reading? It's all of these strands in early reading development or early literacy development, all the strands that Scarborough outlined for us, knowledge, vocabulary, syntax, inferencing, building a mental model, word recognition, um, including sounds and letters and, and words. So all of these things actually help impact reading comprehension or skilled reading. Again, we're gonna focus on these top two, knowledge and vocabulary. So we know that background knowledge is really significant in terms of both reading comprehension and writing composition. And Hugh Katz will remind us that it's chief among the factors influencing reading comprehension. You see how he used that word influencing reading comprehension? And research shows us that how much a reader understand, uh, understands about the text that they're reading before they start to read it is a major factor in how much you understand during and after that reading. And this makes intuitive sense to us. And you know this too, as a reader, that when you pick up a book about the topic of education for all of us, we have a lot of background knowledge about that. And so we're going to be able to read that which, with much better comprehension than if, for, for example, we picked up a text about physics. Now, often we conflate this idea of activating prior knowledge and building background knowledge. And I love this quote um, by Gina Cervetti 
saying that, of course, we might expect that using experiences with text to enrich a student's background knowledge would be important. But more attention has been paid to activating students' existing knowledge than building knowledge. And let's talk about that for a little bit. We know that activating prior knowledge is important as a reader. And we often do this in classrooms and teachers will say, what do you already know about the topic of plants? Or what do you already know about the topic of oceans? And students will share things that they know, but what about the students that don't have existing knowledge? What about them? And what we wanna make sure that we do in our classrooms is think about using them as a place to build knowledge so that students can later draw on that knowledge as prior knowledge. And so we're going to change our thinking just a little bit to, yes, of course, activating knowledge is important. Students activate knowledge on their own, typically, when they see a topic that they know something about. But what's really important is that we help students build that knowledge in ways uh, that help them then access that later as prior knowledge. If you're not familiar with the American Educator, I really encourage you to uh, Google it and get access to it. It's free online for you. Um, and there's lots of great articles, both in the past in the present and coming up in the future that really link to evidence-based practices and better understanding literacy from an evidence-based lens. In the winter of 21-22, Hugh Katz authored a great article, which interestingly was in a, um, which was in an issue dedicated to science, but rethinking how to promote reading comprehension. And I love this article because what he says in this article is, you know, as a researcher, at one point I forgot how important background knowledge um, is to a reader. And he says in this article, that knowledge must accumulate over time to ensure a level of depth that allows for a critical analysis of the subject matter. Now that sentence is loaded with all kinds of interesting things, but what I want you to recognize here is a couple of things. First of all, it has to accumulate over time. You know that you can't pick up a book on a new topic that you've never had knowledge of before and become an expert in that with one read. Knowledge is slow to develop, just like most of the things with language, right? It accumulates over time. And the more you read about a topic, the more you write about a topic, the more you hear about a topic, the better you are able to critically and analyze that subject matter. And I know I was a classroom teacher and I was a building uh, administrator, and I know we're really encouraged get your students to the higher levels of blooms, right? Get them analyzing information, evaluating information. But I'm telling you that, um, I don't have this on a slide, but I'm gonna do it with my hand here. Bloom's taxonomy is sort of a triangle and on the bottom is knowledge. And I will tell you that it's really difficult to critically analyze things that you have no knowledge of. So think about that as we're trying to develop our students' knowledge and vocabulary. Okay, I'm gonna give you a little bit of an example here. So I want you to think about who is the better reader in this example. So I, I travel a lot before COVID, I traveled a lot more. Uh, my husband is a, a former chief financial officer and often he would travel with me and at breakfast, we would pick up the newspaper and read the newspaper and he would pick up the business and finance section and he would be able to skim through the information in there, you know, gain new knowledge, um, have some, you know, vocabulary that he was familiar with and kind of critically analyze those articles to say, wow, this author really is on the right track or the art author of this article is not on the right track and, and he would understand why. I can pick up any education related article, let's just say education week, and I can read those, skim through it. I have a lot of background knowledge. Um, I can pick up new information. I can analyze those articles and say, hmm, yep, they got that right. Or, oh, I wonder about this and I'm not sure it's quite right. So. If I were to read the business and finance section, I probably would take longer to read an article than my husband because I don't have the same background knowledge. 
There may be concepts in there that I might not be that familiar with. Um, I couldn't really analyze whether the author was on track or not on track because I don't have the depth of knowledge in that area to be able to do that. So am I a bad reader? No, I'm not a bad reader. It's just that I don't have all the background knowledge and information on that topic to be as critical a reader as what he can be when he picks up that section. So you think about that then as we're putting this into our classroom and thinking about what our classroom uh, looks like and how we're helping students build knowledge. Remember, comprehension isn't either or, it's on a continuum. And you start to comprehend more deeply the more knowledge and vocabulary you have about a topic. Let's look at some comments about knowledge from some leading researchers in this area. We've already talked about this, right? The more readers know about the topic of text, the better their comprehension and learning from text. And if you can see that date, this was an article from 2018. 2019, Susan Newman reminds us that we've largely ignored the fact that the most powerful thing that predicts comprehension is knowledge and background knowledge. And then a more recent article from 2020, the accumulated science of reading clearly points to the necessity of building content knowledge. Now, just a quick aside, sometimes you might hear this referred to as academic knowledge, content knowledge, right? It's the language of school. And uh, particularly for students as they're going out throughout their schooling career, helping, that, helping them access that language is really critical um, to their schooling career and beyond. In 2015, Marilyn Adams said like prior knowledge about the topic of hand is like mental Velcro. Now remember, we wanna help students build that knowledge before we ask them to access that as prior knowledge. And so this relevant knowledge gives the words of text places to be sticky. So the, the more that you know about a topic, the more you're going to learn about that topic as you engage in more reading around and around it. So it takes time to develop. All right, a really recent article about cultivating content knowledge. Does it really work? Does it really show evidence of outcomes? And in this article, the authors did a meta-analysis. In other words, they looked at a whole bunch of research that was relevant to developing and cultivating content knowledge and looking at the impact that, of that then on both vocabulary and comprehension outcomes. And the results of this meta-analysis, and this was, report was just released in 2023, tells us that they, it's, we have a positive impact on vocabulary and comprehension when ELA instruction is content rich. And what do we mean by content rich? It means that we're teaching kids about topics. And when we pull that into ELA instruction, we really help them develop vocabulary and develop as better comprehenders. Hold on to that because we're gonna come back to that and connect it to another reader's research article in a minute. Now, Nancy Hennessy, who I know is going to be on an upcoming webinar, if you haven't registered for that one, you must. She is amazing. I'd like to read you this um, because I think it's pretty powerful. She says that although some might argue that the primary goal of vocabulary instruction should be its influence on comprehension, a broader perspective includes the development of an access to an academic lexicon that allows students not only to listen and read with comprehension, but also express understanding and thinking orally and in writing. Let's unpack that. Academic lexicon. Those are all the words of schooling. All a lexicon is, is those words that you have access to that you can utilize, you can um, tap into when you're listening to people talk about that topic, when you're reading about that topic, when you're trying to talk about that topic and when you're trying to write about that topic. Doesn't that sound like comprehensive literacy? Listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And so we know vocabulary is really important um, to reading comprehension, but vocabulary is really about a broader comprehension um, idea and it's related to background knowledge. 
All right, let's stop for a minute and have you do a quick activity here. I want you to look at that word spring. And I wonder what comes to mind, what kind of mental picture you get when you hear the word spring. So first of all, did you think of a noun? Or did you think of a verb? So is that image that you have in your head a noun or is it a verb? Because a spring could be literally a spring, maybe spring the season, or maybe the action word spring. And why this is so important is because it shows how broad we need to be in vocabulary, how deep we need to be in vocabulary, and how uh, flexible we need to be in our vocabulary use. So let's think about vocabulary. We know it's highly predictive of reading comprehension, and this came in the year 2000, right? You can see this in the National Reading Panel Report. It's one of the reasons we focus on vocabulary so much in our ELA instruction. But remember, it's not vocabulary just for vocabulary purposes. It's the bridge between these word level processes, right? Like reading the word or thinking the word like in the last slide and the cognitive processes of comprehension. And Marilyn Adams reminds us that it's through words that we build, refine and modify knowledge. So you can't have vocabulary without knowledge. You can't have knowledge without vocabulary. And what makes it so valuable and important isn't just the word, but because it unlocks understanding. It's like a gateway or a doorway into comprehension. Okay, another link to um, another research article. And this one comes from Fitzgerald and Shanahan. And they talk about this idea of shared knowledge. What do we mean by that? Well, shared knowledge is essentially reading and writing we're conceptualizing reading and writing as sort of two different buckets, but they draw from this common well or this common shared knowledge model. So, you know, we were talking about what you're learning and the vocabulary that you have. You're going to use that in one way while you're reading, and you're going to use that in another way while you're writing. This article shows some categories of knowledge that readers and writers use. And I want you to particularly focus on the second bullet, domain knowledge about substance and content, meaning prior knowledge, content knowledge, all of that while we're, that's gained while we're both reading and writing. The thing that's missing here, and I'm sure that they meant to include it, is this idea of building background knowledge so that it can be used for prior knowledge to use while you're reading and writing. All right, let's talk through some instructional applications here. Here we go again, Nancy Hennessy, shout out to the webinar coming up. But also, if you haven't listened to the episode of the podcast from season three, episode nine, I really encourage you to go back and listen to it because it'll help you understand reading comprehension a little bit more holistically, um, as well as with knowledge and vocabulary. If you haven't purchased this book yet, I encourage you to purchase this book. It is, I think, one of the most comprehensive texts that's really applicable to the classroom in terms of that language comprehension side of Scarborough's Rope. It will systematically help you go through, understand each of those strands and then how to put them in practice. She talks in this text about how do we develop academic knowledge? Remember the language of school. And she reminds us that what kids actually read matters. Now, this sounds like it should be intuitive. Well, of course, what kids read matters. But often what we do is that we're so interested in comprehension strategies, finding the main idea, summarizing what you read, that the content of the text, whether it's fiction, um, informational text, um, it often gets lost. The content gets lost in service of trying to get kids to learn these strategies. So we want to make sure that we're getting kids reading material that matters, that's developing their background knowledge and developing their academic knowledge. We also want to make sure they're le learning what they read. Again, that sounds, of course, they should learn what they read. 
But again, often we are putting the strategies ahead of the content. And what we should be doing is putting the content out first and then supporting the learning of that content by using various strategies. She also will remind us that in order to learn the information, you have to spend extended time on a topic. So don't think that you can read a short article about oceans for kids to really gain background knowledge. What you need to do is spend two to three weeks in a topic, understanding that topic, making new connections, building a web of information um, with the connected and associated vocabulary. Vocabulary, again, you cannot have knowledge of something without the associated vocabulary. They just interact and go hand in hand. And vocabulary, it's really important that definitions and contexts are, uh, are equally important. I guess I said that, right? So it's not just focusing on the definition. Definitions, student-friendly definitions, they're important but really the context in which the words are used will help carry students through and help them deeply process words that connects to this known information. So you can learn new vocabulary words about a topic that you're understanding and see how they connect. And this web actually helps students as they're reading because then you know, the more threads we have in this web, the more information they're going to capture and better reading comprehension and writing composition. And again, you need to spend extended time in, notice it says in, not on a topic. And what do I mean by that? We need to give kids chances to think about and talk about and read and write about those things that they're learning so that they have practice using vocabulary words. They have practice deeply processing these words and information so they come away from this experience really capturing background knowledge and vocabulary that they can use the next time they encounter a similar topic. Now, you have to do this, um, not in a haphazard way, but Barbara Davidson and David Lieben wrote an article. And again, you can Google this one and get access to it for free. What a knowledge building approach looks like in the classroom. And what they will remind us is that the advantage of a coherent curriculum is that topics it covers build on one another. Think about that web, right? So if we teach kids about plants and then in another unit, we teach them about farms, we're going to actually help them grow their knowledge, make new connections and really get foundations. So uh, one unit should pro provide a foundation of knowledge for others that come later, both in a school year and across grade levels. And again, I really encourage you to Google this article and read it because they give you really practical information about it, what it looks like in the classroom. Here's kind of an example, um, a kindergarten through eighth grade example. And you'll notice, I guess it's kind of small, but we're gonna, we're gonna make it a little bit bigger. You'll notice here in kindergarten, the five senses, and then you grow on those five senses in the human body unit in grade one, and you grow on that in the human body unit in grade three, and you grow on that in a brain science unit in grade seven. So as you start to expand and do more and more and more of these topics, it really benefits kids in terms of their reading comprehension and their writing composition. So I want to talk to you just really quickly about um, Amplify's ELA program for K pre-K through five called Core Knowledge Language Arts. And I want to show you from the science of reading perspective why it's really a premier program in terms of bringing students what they need to develop and grow as readers and writers. The uh, Amplify CKLA is based on the simple view of reading, both developing word recognition and language comprehension to get meaning from text. In kindergarten through second grade, we have two strands of knowledge. We're gonna come back to this language comprehension one and dive into that a little bit more because that's the focus of this webinar. But the program also teaches the important word recognition or foundational skills. So two strands, right? Similar to Scarborough's reading rope, right? One to develop word recognition, one to develop language comprehension, 
By the time we get to grades three through five, it's an integrated strand, just like Scarborough's rope, where kids are reading and writing um, in parallel with each other, uh, practicing their uh, word recognition in the context of text. Amplify CKLA addresses these foundational skills. I'm going to go through this really quickly. Phonological awareness, decoding sight recognition through explicit systematic instruction, starting with the sound, build to the phoneme, cracking that code then and growing in complexity to get kids practicing in that word recognition. And not just in isolation of reading, but also, or isolation of phonics, sorry, but also some daily practice and reinforcement with writing. Kids are reading connected text, so they're actually applying the skills the minute they start to map those sounds to letters. Um, and then they're also writing about those texts that they're reading about. So that's all kind of on the word recognition side of the house. I want to spend just a few more minutes talking about oh, how Amplify approaches knowledge building for comprehension, language comprehension, this idea of background knowledge, vocabulary. We're going to talk a little bit about languages and sentences and, and, this, and this literary knowledge. So here's what you're going to look for in a coherent curriculum, like Barbara Davidson and David Lieben wrote about in that article. The idea here is we're going to use kindergarten as an example where students are actually building their knowledge within units in kindergarten. And I'm gonna use farms, that's not highlighted. Whoop, plants, farms. And then we move to seasons and weather, taking care of the earth. You can see how all of these things start to grow. But you can also see the science connections beginning in pre-K, habitats. And then as we move through taking care of the earth, the history of the earth, cycles in nature, ecology, geology, chemical matters. You can see how topics continue to grow, which give kids time to actually practice their learning, practice their vocabulary, and grow that knowledge web that we were talking about. Um, we also, Amplify CKLA, leverages that relationship between le listening comprehension and reading comprehension. So in the early grades, when kids are in kindergarten, first and second grade, these read alouds really are designed to grow from lesson to lesson and from unit to unit, helping engage students then in the content and vocabulary. And by the time they get into the upper grades, then we have more active reading where they're taking that knowledge. They're taking the word recognition that they've already developed from kindergarten through second grade and really engaging much more deeply with those topics uh, with text in hand. Amplify CKLA builds background knowledge that students then use later. So in today's lesson, we are going to review what we learned yesterday. We're going to use yesterday's knowledge as prior knowledge and build on that knowledge so that tomorrow uh, we're building even more. And that background knowledge is developed in a multi multiple ways. Um, so that students can engage in that content both visually and orally through listening comprehension um, and also in, you know, interactive read alouds by engaging with that content of the read aloud text and the text in hand. Vocabulary is totally connected to the context in which they're learning those words. And so the word work here is habitats, which is all in the context of insects. So we're not learning vocabulary in isolation, but that vocabulary is actually part of the knowledge development. This also extends to formal writing. Remember, we're gonna use all that knowledge that we have and that we're gaining uh, for our reading comprehension, but also in our writing composition. Now, um, I know that we're getting, and we might be able to take some questions. That's really exciting. Um, what I want to do is introduce you to the Knowledge Matters campaign, because it's not just Amplify that believes that building knowledge um, is important. It's not just us that have sort of highlighted the research on how important background knowledge is and vocabulary. There's a whole campaign called the Knowledge Matters Campaign, and I would love for you to visit this website. You see, um, if you can see up at the top, they have a blog. They have a great podcast series done by Natalie Wexler, all about the importance 
um, of background knowledge. We're gonna come back to this review tool, but you can see here there's a whole lot of resources to help us understand how knowledge about the world fuels a child's reading comprehension and critical thinking. They've recent, re recently um, released a review tool, meaning that you can use this tool to put against your K-8 ELA curriculum to see if it's really quality in terms of content rich and is it aligned to the research on what, what we know about reading comprehension in terms of building background knowledge and vocabulary. And I'm really excited to tell you that CKLA is a featured curriculum on the Knowledge Matters campaign, a content rich literacy uh, curriculum. And it says here, distinguished by robust and sequential knowledge building as well as systematic foundational skills. So we're not doing one without the other, right? We know that building foundational skills and word recognition is so critical but we also know that if we don't pay attention to building background knowledge and developing that language comprehension in the early grades, by the time kids get to grades three and up, we've really lost time. So when you're thinking about your needs in the classroom, um, how your instruction is happening from pre-K all the way up through grade eight, we wanna make sure we're paying attention to the ongoing development of building background knowledge and vocabulary. I'm gonna pop into the Q&A box and um, see if there is any questions. Um, a question about articles to share about intervention based on grade level text and scaffolding. We're really not talking about that right now. What we are talking about, remember, is um, uh, knowledge, right? Like developing that knowledge. Um, and I'm going to look in the chat just to see if there's any comments, Lauren, in there that if you do have any questions, we'd love for you to put them in the chat. I see Lauren has put in the chat information about Nancy Hennessy's upcoming webinar, which is going to be so great. Um, but I don't actually see any questions, Lauren. Did you see any that were in that chat? I had one or two, um, okay. so I like to send them to you uh, verbally. Yeah, Is there please. a difference in the gains made by focusing on building knowledge across many different topics versus diving deeper into a few or one specific topic? That's a really good question. And um, I think I'm going to stop sharing so that I can just uh, be on screen here. I think that... Um, uh, what we, what we know is that breadth is really important, right? Kids, especially in pre-K through, through eighth grade, need a lot of information about a lot of topics. We also know that going deep is important too. And I would say there's not a lot of research that says, should, should we be doing one topic for an entire quarter or should we not be doing a topic for an entire quarter? What I would say is a good balance and a good combination is probably the right thing. You know, I think about students' motivation, how important motivation is in the classroom. And if you're only doing one topic, let's say for an entire quarter, if a student isn't motivated or interested in that topic, it's going to be a long nine weeks of instruction just on a, on a topic. On the other hand, if you're just doing one topic and then a different topic another day, or even one topic per week, it might not be enough time to actually engage in that topic. So I think a good balance is really important. Um, I do know that one of the th one of the questions people often ask about um, some of the knowledge building curriculum, partic particularly CKLA, is well, how much should they know about this topic? Should they memorize all the concepts and all the words and everything as we're talking about plants? And remember the goal here isn't for them to have mastery over the content because you don't really ever totally get mastery over a content, but to continue to provide kids exposure and connections, exposure and connections, exposure and connections. Great, and following up on that, Erin um, came in with the chat with the question, how does this then connect, inform, and or change standardized state assessments? Oh, such a good question. You know, one of the things that we did, and I didn't include this slide, but um, you know, if you think about um, 
what kids do when they're taking a state assessment. And Dan Willingham will talk about this, right? So teaching reading is teaching content. If you haven't seen that sort of classic video, you should, you should Google it. But the idea is, is when you encounter a topic, if you know something about that topic, right, your reading comprehension is going to be much better. You're going to be able to answer the questions on that standardized assessment. And so that breadth of knowledge that we can get kids exposed to really helps them when it comes to standardized assessments. Obviously, if you were taught it, you're going to read, you're going to be able to comprehend that reading much better. And we did <clears throat> several years ago, sort of a relationship between the topics that are covered in CKLA and typical topics that are covered on state standardized assessments. And we found that um, about 80% of those topics that were covered on state assessments were actually also covered in CKLA. That means that when kids are familiar with that content or familiar with that topic, it engages in them right into that reading and really supports them their reading comprehension. Was there another? Great, question? I know a lot of a lot of other um, questions came in asking for additional resources they could share with their teachers or admin, um, or if you could share later on some of those links that you referenced in your presentation. Um, we can include those in the email. Sure. And I would point them to the, um, the science of reading websites that you have already put, I think in the chat that they'll be able to get great information there as well. Again, don't forget about the, the upcoming webinars that are going to give uh, more information. There's a, another question that came up in the Q and A I'd like to answer too, Lauren, do we have time for that? Yes, we do. Um, the question is what would be considered knowledge building in stories, right? Or in, um, uh, in literary text, themes and genres, you know, it, uh, now it, you would be surprised knowledge building. I'm going to show this example, right? I used the phantom toll booth here. And, um, I'll tell you that as I read through this, this, this book was written in, I don't know, the sixties, the late sixties, I think really relevant though, uh, theme and stuff for, for today, the, how many kids know what a toll booth is or how many kids need to understand why, Milo in this story had a map to take him from one place to another, right? We think about GPSs now. Um, what about uh, coins? Why did Milo need coins to get through the toll booth? And so when you think about the knowledge behind the vocabulary or the context behind some of the settings or the events that are happening in stories, there is a lot of knowledge building that needs to happen for students to be able to then engage in the text and at a deeper level of comprehension. So it's a really good question. Um, we've got some uh, upcoming uh, science uh, podcast, whoops, sorry, upcoming podcasts that actually talk a lot about this, how knowledge building and vocabulary are going to be related then to the text that you read and the kind of composition. Um, that you ask students to write. I think I answered them all. I think so too, I'm dropping the link to the podcast uh, landing page back in the chat for everyone to reference as well. Great, and can you remind us of what the next webinar in this series is, Lauren? Yes, I'm gonna bring that slide up right now. That is awesome. I caught you off guard, didn't I? <laughs> Hold up the wrong, the wrong screen there. Uh, there we go. All right, so our um, next upcoming webinar is on Wednesday. We have a CKLA and ELA administrator customer panel, and then we have three additional webinars uh, next week. So we can drop that link in the chat and we encourage you to save your seat and register to join us at amplify.com slash knowledge dash building dash webinar dash series. And before we wrap up today, I just wanted to also um, encourage everyone to download our amazing knowledge building content bundle, which includes eBooks, infographics, and more um, to help you get started with knowledge-based learning. And I wanna thank Susan again for her wonderful presentation today. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to join us and for Susan for presenting. Um, will any other questions that hop in the chat? If not, we will uh, conclude today's webinar. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you so much, Susan.
Thank you, Lauren. Have a great day, everyone.